afternoon, everyone. Hi, it's my pleasure to be here. I've sat through the conference this afternoon in awe. Every single speaker has been amazing. It's been such a great session. Uh, and I'm a bit concerned that we won't have anything new to add. However, uh, I was giving some thoughts. I've had quite a few moments. I've had quite a long career. But there have been one or two things that kind of stuck out. And the first one, which I'll mention now, maybe we'll come back to some others later, you might think, well, this is completely obvious, but it was a bit of a revelation to me when I properly worked out that women are different from men, not in the way that you're thinking, but it, in the workplace, women act differently to men. And I genuinely think, unless you have a proper understanding of why that is and how that works, both men and women, it's kind of hard to create the sort of diverse teams and then nurture talent and bring people through in the way that you that you really need to. So, you know, there's a different discussion on this and anybody can contact me if they're interested. But generically, in interviews, actually doing the job and looking for recognition and negotiating salaries, women do differently than men. And if you understand that, it unlocks a lot of keys. Now, there are lots of other moments, but I'll stop there and leave you with that one to start with, Brian. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So um, by way of introduction, um, Suzanne, let me let me come to you. Tell us a little bit about your, um, your view of leadership, because your book is, is obviously ideal for people that are starting on a leadership journey or maybe are, are well into it. So tell us a little bit about this confidence and competence thing. Yeah. So for me, it was all about, okay, why the heck do we value confidence so highly? People always come to sessions and say, I really want more confidence, I want confidence. But the thing is, nobody says, I want more competence. <laughs> and that's really what I feel we should be rewarding. And actually one of the things that was so great about what Rebecca just said was that it reminded me of a story she told me 14 maybe years ago, where <laughs> I see her looking like this. <laughs> where she said one of the things she noticed was how frequently she interviewed people and she'd have two good quality candidates. And the woman would say, oh, I'm not as good as this. Uh, I could use a little bit more work on that. And the guy who had the same qualifications would not only tell you why he was great and had nothing, but he would tell you on what he, how, why he was the best candidate, the only candidate she could probably ever look at. So. For me, that is what inspired me, those conversations and every conversation I've had with every client who has said, you know what, I'm routinely being shown, being told that I need more confidence, but when I show it, I'm either judged poorly or people don't react well to it. Um, and I thought, why does it even matter? Because actually what people really want is you to be good at your job. So I'm all about team competence. <laughs> so let's be competent, people. That's the cool thing. <laughs> that's, that's excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. That's really good. Now I'm, I'm going to come to Matt because, as I said, we've got three quite interesting and different perspectives. Now, Matt, you come from the social good side of, of things. So uh, the first question I'd just like to put to you in, in that context is why should our um, leaders and um aspirational leaders be thinking about that part of, of of the role well i think there's a there's a few reasons the first is well a polite way to say it is that i believe there's a moral imperative to think about how we can do social good and benefit our communities the less polite way to say that is you know because we're not going to try and be a dick about things, particularly after COVID. So, um, you know, getting the obvious out of the way. Uh, I think there's some um, some really interesting uh, sort of extra benefits that you find if you um, if you as a leader or you involve your team in participating in doing good in your community or doing good with your core work. I noticed from the um, from the the uh, the report that the BCS has just uh, that's just published the IT leaders report. That, um, that 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 actually this uh, this topic, uh, staff engagement and well-being, is in everybody's top five for 2021. It's just come into the top five, and I think that's a huge reason why actually prioritising social good is a great thing to do this year. Because can we really be kind of mentally well? Can we have a sense of wellness 
if we we don't believe the work that we are doing has purpose and we don't see the impact that that that, that achieves in our in, in our communities be that in our kind of core work perhaps working um as rebecca does in the with lots of public sector organizations or perhaps being in in a voluntary capacity um outside of work so um you know i think there's two two good reasons there uh, to, to to get involved with uh, with with social good either as a leader or as I said you know getting your team behind these initiatives. Lovely, thank you, Matt. Now on the social good side of things, I'm, I'm Suzanne. I didn't really put this in our little list of questions, but I'm going to leap on you now. Um, <laughs> it's in your perception, is there a difference um, in those that take social good more seriously? Um, for example. Are people that are more competent, more likely to be thinking about the social good than those that just fly by the seat of their pants on their confidence? That's a really interesting question. So I haven't seen research around that. However, I do know that loads of people, millennials, but also women, people of color, people who for whom are part of what I call the non-status quo in the book. So that, that is people who are not what are general leaders from a statistical point of view look like who are not heterosexual, male, from a better off background, white, extroverted, those kinds of qualities that tend to look, tend to be rewarded in the workplaces, those people hugely value CSR. They really want a place where they, I mean, I think we all want to work in a place that we're proud of, but the research shows that those elements of CSR and giving back are particularly important to those groups. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, what's your experience on the, on the social good side of things? Do you, do, you, do you think that's very much come up the agenda of late? Absolutely. Completely agree with what Suzanne said. Um, I mean, I think that, the, that, you know, the buzzword is purpose. And I think one has to be really slightly careful about that because I wouldn't want... Um, anybody to just assume everything that every organization does is uh, is done for social good but i think it's absolutely true that um it is no longer enough for a company to just do business any organization now actually needs particularly for the new employees coming through the uh, the more junior levels needs to be able to articulate why why should you work for here? Why should you buy from me? How can this relationship last for decades, not just a transaction? So I, 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 I absolutely, I absolutely think it's got a lot more important. And to Matt's point about the pandemic, let's not waste a good crisis. As we think more about moving to net zero, and that thinking has, has accelerated through the pandemic. I also think we'll be thinking, I hope we're going to think more about social value, collaboration and working together. Excellent. Thank you. In fact, one of the comments in the report was um, that uh, some people felt that the COVID uh, situation forced IT leaders to be more business and value focused than just IT centric. Is, is that your experience, Matt? Yeah, I think so. But I think um, there's two sides to that. And, and, and really, the, the, the pandemic, I think, has put, cast into stark relief the massive inequalities in our society between communities and, and actually has really kind of ravaged the UK as a result of its kind of decades long failure to address those inequalities. And I think, you know, what, what we have as IT leaders, I, I always say, you, you know, um, that sophisticated, suitably um, advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, as the, the old quote goes, right? So we have magic in our hands as IT leaders, and actually it's very easy to thoughtlessly use that magic in ways that are um, you know, not inclusive, in ways that kind of shore up uh, systems of, of, of systemic oppression. And actually by getting more involved in our communities, not only will we attract, to, uh, attract a more uh, diverse workforce, as Suzanne and, and Rebecca points out, but also we'll get more lived experience of different individuals from different backgrounds, different communities, uh, which will help us ensure that we don't accidentally create technologies and create systems that don't work for some people and, and, and further kind of exclude those communities, which, you know, is, a, is, is something that isn't, um, isn't just a kind of a, a paranoid fear, but is something that's absolutely alive in technology, in the public sector, in business today. That's interesting. I, I'm pretty sure that was Arthur C. Clarke, wasn't it, that, that said that? So what we want in our head... It was indeed. 
And yeah, if we've got magic in our hands that we think about rather than a great big bone to hit people with, just referring back to 2001 there. Um, now we've had a couple of questions come in, uh, so that's a good start and keep them coming in, folks. Uh, Jackie Hogan must have read your book, I think, uh, Suzanne, because she said, I've been told I'm pushy or scary. How can women get past the perspective that being assertive is not what people want? So the good or bad news, depending on how you look at it, is Jackie, you are not alone. So I think what's really interesting and why I wanted to write the book was that we are constantly told, and I mean women, but also other groups as well, just show more confidence and you'll succeed. And we all kind of buy it and it put success down the horizon for us, rather than looking at, as Matt just talked about, these systemic inequalities that keep groups back. So I'll give you an example. Jackie will be told all of those things, but women are not the only ones. So I think what's interesting is when people of color, when they act uh, confident, sometimes they're often referred to as being uppity or aggressive or angry. Uh, when I first came to the UK, people who had less money, when they started to act a bit confidence, people were told, I, it was the first place I ever learned the phrase acting above your station. Mm. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that the, we define people based on what we expect from them. But what we expect is what was modeled by what I call the status quo, which is the kinds of people who tend to lead organizations now. And the problem is that continuing with that definition of what success looks like, it not, only, um, it not only rewards the wrong people and continues to, to drive self-promotion and the kind of things that we accept when we think about, you know, when, when he says, uh, you know, he's being confident, he will we'll describe him as being single-minded, determined, you know, all of these things. But and if, a, if a Latina says something like that, we will describe them as being fiery or feisty. So I think that it hinders people from different backgrounds to be judged by the same, I think, outdated versions of what confidence should be, really. And I want to really renegotiate what that means. Um, and that's before we get into the ways we describe women who dare to have an opinion. <laughs> and as Jackie and probably Rebecca probably know, that we have a lot, we have a litany of words for those women. So for me, that's what's really key is let's, let's redefine so it works for all of us because it doesn't even work that well for men either um, or people from whom language, maybe English is their second or third working language or come from cultures where, you know, confident, uh, you know, is just not how they were raised. Mm. Plenty of us will have lots of colleagues for whom those, uh, you know, those are really part of it which is why when I interviewed people for the book, for the con job, I went to 12 different countries and talked to people, 40 different leaders, and they gave me their perspectives. And that was hugely, because I too thought this was initially um, a gender, but it wasn't. It was so much wider um, than what I originally thought. That's interesting, thank you. Um, as I mentioned, uh, well, as we've had mentioned already today, um, the reason that we called the research and um, cloud security and soft skills come into their own is that there's been a lot of mention of that. And uh, I suppose it's good to know that people have realized the importance of that at this particular time. And um, one little quote, I'd just like to, to run past uh, Rebecca, if I can, Rebecca, just to see your view on this. Uh, one person said there's been increased focus on developing soft skills such as emotional intelligence, storytelling, managing time uh, what's your take on that so i i think um the soft skills are more critical actually than even we think they are from our report so um i'm part of a, a kind of quite a big reform program in education um to do with introducing new t levels and one of the things that we that we explore with employers in that program is how can you create people who are agile agile by design if you like so you know having curiosity being emotionally intelligent being able to communicate being able to solve problems um being having an interesting life actually that isn't just about work um look looking for new experiences i think all of these things are more and more important. Somebody earlier today, it may have been Gillian, said, 
I don't look I don't look for people with specific who do things with specific technology. I look for what they can do. And I just think we need we're looking for people who, with sets of competencies around agility and problem solving rather than you know a, a, a specific coding language or a spe- specific methodology. So more and more important. That's interesting. Thank you. Now, um, one of the other questions that's come in on, on the little chat here, which I think I might just direct towards Matt here, on the topic, I, this is like a nuance on the same subject, on the topic of diversity, has cognitive diversity started to bubble to the surface? What's your, your view there? Yeah, uh, absolutely, it has. Um, one one thing when I'm talking to sort of quite challenging people on, on, on these topics is sometimes you say, oh, when will it end? You, you, you know, it's kind of one protected characteristic after another protected characteristic. And I think the simple answer to that is when everybody, um, you know, regardless of their situation, where they were born, a characteristic about them is able to be treated equally in society is when it will end. And there is a lot of mileage left to go on that, uh, including in neurodivergence, as the as the questioner astutely points out there. So, you know, th- th- this is, um, yeah, this is a really interesting area in IT, I think, because IT is a traditionally quite a neurodiverse sector. So it's not an area where we've struggled for diversity, but it is one in which that sometimes technology struggles, ironically, to serve people with neurodivergence because of, because of some of the systemic issues that, that we've touched upon. I think interestingly as well from, from picking up on Rebecca's point about how we create uh, teams which are agile and which can solve problems. I, I read a fascinating report uh, from the Bank of England uh, around the time of the last financial crash where they had a, they, 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 they had a recruitment policy that favoured particular personality types. And this was actually enshrined in place by a, a, a a psychographic, you know, personality test on, on entry for interview, which was which is quite common in a lot of organizations still. And what they found that they ended up with is a lot of people that thought the same way about things. And that wasn't a very resilient organization, actually, because it was an organization that thought the same way about everything. And when new problems emerged, there wasn't a diversity of problem solving abilities and, and, and methods of thought to allow them to tackle that. And, and you know, it's interesting to consider that in, in the context of something like a financial crash, for example, which requires, you know, novel thinking um, or requires people to spot problems or spot weaknesses in the market uh, that other people aren't seeing. And if we create a homogenous organization without cognitive diversity, then not only is that unethical, but we also miss out on, on, on those capabilities. Yeah, that's interesting. Do, do you think there might be, um, and I'm going to open, open this question to everybody who wants to pick this up, there might be a, a particular problem for IT leaders in that so many things that are thought of as, well, we must measure this, everything's got to be measurable. And so, so, of course, some of the soft skills, really, in the, the day, a lot of these things aren't particularly measurable, are they? They are just a good way of treating people and create harmony and things like that. So is, is there a tension there, do you think? Who'd like to... He looks keen to... Suzanne, go on. I had um, a gentleman that I interviewed for the book who is a tech leader up here in Scotland. And he said the problem with the fact that certain, certain people get ahead because the things that they're delivering on are high value. But I know for a fact that the people who support them and make their teams work are people who are really good at the soft skills. But because we are a tech team, we don't value that. Yet, on, even on the days when people who have the soft skills are not there, if they're on holiday, the rest of us are kind of like, well, get on with it, but this doesn't feel right. And what was so interesting is he said, he said, I suspect that the reason those soft skills and those types of competencies aren't valued, he said, is because they're mostly done by women. And I thought that was a very insightful point that he made about it. It, it was, yeah, very interesting. So I, I just I'm going to build on that a bit because I think there's a thing here about authenticity and there's, um, you know, especially for people who are in some kind of minority, you have to be authentic in the way that you're a leader and the way that you're a leader is the bit that's not measurable or often is the bit that's not measurable. I, I did a I did a, a a psychometric test recently because you know I think continual professional development is really important and I'm still doing it and I had a piece of feedback which I'm going to read out because I was so proud of it and it goes like this: Rebecca is not known for her ruthless commercial acumen, increasing margins, and focusing on profitability. 
She is known for doing the right thing. I know which I prefer. Now that's about something you can't measure, but it's about being authentic and trying to do the right thing. And I think that's what people look for in leaders. So I was proud when I got that. I can see where you would be. That makes that makes perfect sense, that sort of thing, doesn't it? And I wonder, actually, Rebecca, Karen, talking to you about this for a little bit, whether uh, drawing a point in that uh, Suzanne made, that it's not just about um, uh, gender differences or... Um, um, Words completely gone there. Um, uh, cognitive oh, diversity, maybe. Cognitive, yeah, <laughs> or cognitive di di differences. Uh, there's also a lot of cultural differences, aren't there? Now, you're in a very large organisation. Uh, do, do you think that um, managers are, are getting more aware of, of taking account of cultural differences? Because that's a lot of education required, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I think, by the way, a lot of education is required. And I think large organisations are lucky because we have both the resources and the kind of time to be able to devote to it. Mm. Um, I sit on the board of the City Mental Health Alliance and we've just um, published our mental health toolkit on race. Now, you know, this is as important as anything else which is going on right now. Um, and it requires education and culture requires education and changing people's behaviours requires education. And most of all, getting people to understand their own hidden values and work with that is it requires education and it requires work. And so that's one of the reasons why I think professionalism, professionalism is so important, because you have to find the environments for people to be able to carry on learning this stuff all their careers. Yeah, that's really interesting. So here's another little remark from the report then. Now, occasionally I'll put these things in because they make you smile, but they always try and make a point. So here's here's one. Um, negatives, I asked about negatives. We asked about negatives that need to be addressed. Uh, Responder said it has shown that know-it-alls don't actually know it all and that we are not immune to the basic business practices or continuity planning. And it just made me think of people that are highly qualified in some areas kind of think that that transfers to all the other areas of life. Um, a dose of humility required, perhaps? Suzanne? Yeah, so this reminds me very much around what people do not understand. So people often think that competence and confidence, they go up and together, they're laterally moving, you kind of join that way. But actually, the research shows they are conversely related, which means that the more competent you become in something, the more you have doubts because really you see how much more there is to learn. You also know how many more people there are to bring in and understand. And equally, going back to the Dunning-Kruger effect, the less you know about something, the more you think you do. So mm -hmm. that's hugely worrisome for me. And it should be for all business leaders, which is that certainty is very attractive, but it's actually really dangerous for any organization. And, you know, for me, that's that's hugely worrying. Mm. I, thank you. I, I met you nodding away there, Matt, when we were <laughs> we're talking about the know-it-all sort of uh, mentality. What's your view? I just think that there's there's a whole wide world out there of, of you know different people that um, some some people that could benefit from from some support you know and actually um, there's there's nothing like actually broadening your perspectives by getting out in your community volunteering getting out from behind your desk you know the great privileges we have working in IT is that we've been largely able to shield ourselves from what's going on the majority of the profession work from home you know open our laptops the flip side of that is that you know we've we've become disconnected actually. Uh, and if you if you want a dose of humility, then you know it's right there on your doorstep. If you're willing to go out uh, and actually roll your sleeves up and uh, you know get involved and, and talk to talk to people again, you, you know about what's going on around you in your community. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that, that that's what I'd recommend right now. That's great, thank you. Now I, we've had some interesting stuff here already. What I'd like to do is also just ask you about some of the people that have inspired you in, in the things that you do. So maybe, m might be people in the audience already know, but maybe not, just just people that they can perhaps draw on as you have done. Can I start with you, Rebecca? Who, who, who have you looked to in the past or currently and, and been inspired, whether it be in this diversity area or just in your leadership role? Well, there have been lots of people I've been blessed 
to have worked with some amazing people, mainly men, uh, through my career who've, who have been awesome leaders and done a fantastic job. IBM had the most amazing diversity leader back in the 1990s over in the US, uh, who, was, who was incredibly influential um, to me uh, in terms of getting me to understand why the diversity agenda mattered. Um, from a professional point of view, I have to say it, I am a massive fan of Dame Stephanie Shirley. Um, I have been for years. I am honoured that I'm going to be interviewing her for a video coming out on International Women's Day with another great uh, mentor of mine, Dame Wendy Hall. Um, and another person I will mention is Dame Sue Street, who was a permanent secretary and told me all about being super polite to public sector clients, which really, really, really matters. But the final person I'm going to mention is somebody called Andrew White, who is an IT architect. And I mention him because through my career, I've worked with quite a lot of IT architects. And it's been my job quite often to kind of translate what they do into language that businesses and boards understand. But people like Andrew sit and design the systems. They put together the architectures of the IT systems to make sure that they work and they're safe and secure. And they are my unsung heroes. Lovely. Thank you very much. Suzanne, same question for you. I, I, I know you've interviewed a lot of different people, but uh, some highlights. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I think I've got to be honest, I, you know, I've written three books and I would say that everybody that I've ever worked with was interviewed, but also the clients that I coach on an individual basis are hugely inspiring to me because they tend to be, not exclusively, but they tend to be women who work in male dominated fields. And they bring to me these, these challenges they have and we work through them and, and that's fantastic. But I remember one in particular many, many years ago that got me thinking about this con job that I wrote then 13 years later. And she was a woman named Sonia. And I remember her being told by a boss that she had, he said, you know, Sonia, you are fantastic. I trust you with everything, but you need to big yourself up a bit more and, and you know, self-promote and tell people what you're great at, blah, blah, blah. And so she said she got a, 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 a job change and we were still coaching throughout this period. And she went to a different team. But when she did that, so she, she was like, I can reinvent myself. No one knows me here. And so she did do those things and she talked more in meetings. And what was so interesting is the feedback she got back from her new boss was that she was being pushy and bullshy. And it's all these things that made me think, what is this fine line? that so many people have to walk mm. um, and what is the cost to them and also the cost to their organizations. Because one of the pieces of research that you guys talked about was, you know, you did this, one of the priorities I saw in the, in the report was that the number one thing, people wanted transformative business. So that's really, you know, that word was huge. And what was so interesting to me is PwC did a piece of research several years ago, and they looked at 6,000 leaders across Europe to look at who had what they called transformative, the ability to make a difference, a big change in a transformative way for a team within an organization. And what they found was when they looked at demographics, they found, and Re Rebecca, no doubt you're gonna laugh, and I love this, this statistic too, they found that the demographic that had the most transformative leaders, people they called strategist leaders, we're actually women over 55. <laughs> mm. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what was interesting about that was that they said, well, what does it take to be a strategist leader? And what they were looking at was, to Matt's word, they were looking at, they acted with humility, they listened a lot, they used very positive language, and they'd had a number of roles in different organizations. So they really were always kind of listening and learning to the people around them but they had the biggest, the most, you know, bang for buck when it came to making a transformative change for an organization. I thought that was really amazing. That is fascinating. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. Uh, Matt, come to you. Um, inspirations, people that have, have, have given you something. Well, just uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had the privilege to to talk to uh, a friend of mine uh, on a similar event like this, uh, who is Pips Bunce who is a director at Credit Suisse, uh, heading up their global markets technology arm. 
and uh, Pips is uh, is trans, is uh, specifically um, gender fluid and non-binary. And we spoke about uh, the first time that, that, that she turned up to work uh, expressing a, a female identity uh, in front of her team for the first time and how that has enabled her to be authentic as a leader now. Um, and um, yeah, they've got, gone on to set up uh, 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 and, and be involved in a LGBT allies network at Credit Suisse, which has then uh, seen Pips advise Parliament and uh, uh, and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, I was just really inspired by Pips' story about how actually bringing our authentic selves to work um, can can really have these massive positive knock on effects in terms of uh, our, our abilities as leaders coming through that. As Rebecca said, that the importance of authenticity. Uh, but also how we can how we can do good in other ways laterally across our organisations by by setting those examples and and, and you know uh, showing ourselves to be an ally to people with diverse experiences. That's interesting. Thank you very much. Now we've had a couple of comments come in um, while we've been talking there. Um, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll direct this one to Suzanne. Um, thank you. Um, treading a fine line equals a glass ceiling. Double standard question mark. <laughs> Probably about double, right. Yeah, double standards, definitely. But I think what's interesting is the same behaviors. Like, I don't mind if we want to describe confidence as being forthright or someone who steps up or someone who's passionate or speaks with conviction. That's fine with me. But when people who are not status quo, when they do the same things, then we need to reward them just the same way. And right now, we just don't. Um, we tend to look down and think, who does she think she is? You know, she's being ballsy, ballsy, difficult. I mean, the, the phrase ballsy just shows how much we, we equate power and who's allowed to have it with masculinity. Mm. So for me, I mean, that's, you know, one, but there's so many words that we use to throw at people who show confidence, but not in ways we're comfortable with necessarily. And just as another quick plug, we discussed quite a few of those words in the uh, podcast that we recorded, didn't we, Suzanne? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun yeah. one, yes. <laughs> um, first, I'm just going to pass on to a little bit of self-promotion then. Um, first, I'm just going to pass on to um, uh, Rebecca, if I can. Um, Mike Brady just comments, we have recently done a course on managing at distance. Do the speakers have an opinion? Is that something you've been doing at, uh, at your... your um... Yeah, so, I mean... There's a whole range of new uh, of new stuff that's emerged uh, with the third of the workforce has been working from home over the last year, and I think there's a you know there's a lot of work that's going to need to be done about what is the work that needs to be done uh, with other people, and what can be uh, done alone. But in terms of the actual management, it's kind of interesting. I first managed a global team in 1995. I never really saw them. I mean, we might have got together once a year. Um, so the concept of having, of being a manager and managing people at a distance, that's not a new concept. It's new in the context of everybody being kind of fragmented. And I think that's the thing that needs to be addressed, not necessarily the concept of managing from a distance. From a personal point of view, the way that I've always addressed it is by one-on-one -on -one interactions with individuals and it is time consuming but it is it, it's impossible to do it any other way if you want people to feel valued you have to value them which means you have to spend time with them and zoom you know fortunately for us is a much better technology than we've had before and it's more possible to do that but right now i don't think it's ever been more important to invest time in individuals as much and as often as you can as a leader uh, because because that's what that that's what shows them that they're valued right thank you rebecca now you're not going to believe this 36 minutes of shot by that quick uh, it's been an excellent conversation i really enjoyed it so in the couple of minutes left i, I want to ask one more question to you all um if you were talking to an IT pro now who just wanted to move into a leadership role, what kind of advice would you give them? Maybe one or two things. There's all sorts of things we could say, but maybe what's what comes first to mind? Can I start with you, Matt, on that? Is that uh... Yeah, I mean, the first thing I would say is that although it might feel like a progression within the same industry, you're actually starting a whole new job 
uh, and requiring a whole new set of, of competencies in order to, to really excel at that role, I would say. So, you, you know, take that in mind when you when you move forward. It might be about letting go of some competencies that you have before to make room for some new ones. And secondly, I would say that um, a lot of those things are going to be about people. And, um, you, you, you know, uh, I'm, there's an awful lot that you can read about people uh, in books and on online training, but nothing beats actually just getting <laughs> having great quality conversations with your team. So you could only invest in one area in terms of your own professional development at that point. I would really say it would be in your skills in how to have really meaningful, authentic, empathetic conversations with people. I think that would serve you very well in that transition. Excellent. Thank you. Suzanne, what, what would you say to that? What, one or two key bits of advice? So I'm definitely building on Matt's, you know, taking it to the next level. I think the great thing that um, stymies people sometimes is they think that it will be enough to continue to be a SME, a subject matter expert or an individual contributor. But if you want leadership, then the truth is your, how well you do is really going to be reliant on your team. So to that point, I think you should be working on your empathy and self-awareness because the research shows those are some of the most killer apps, if you will, for leaders because uh, they allow, the, the people who have those skills are the ones who are most likely to bring complementary skills to the table. So work on your self-awareness and your empathy and, and that's an amazing skill to have. And you could do that even in your free time. Just read novels by people who are not like you, watch television or movies that feature characters who have nothing to do from different countries, different races. Just get in that wider world perspective. Thank you very much. And I think you might have given us a nice title for the write-up of this event, Empathy is the Killer App. I really <laughs> like that. Um, <laughs> Let me come to Rebecca finally. Rebecca, what, what, what advice would you give? Oh, I, I, I'm going to build on what both Matt and Susanna said, both of, both of whom I completely and utterly agree. But I, I'm going to say um, the other thing that, that you need as a leader is you need to be a kind of well-rounded person. And, and that means you have, you're interesting, you have an interesting life and you do interesting things. So I will tell you, I learned more about being a leader running a roller skating club in Bognor Region than I did in any job that I've done for a professional organization. And I learned to roller skate. I'll leave that with you. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely excellent. Um, Suzanne, Matt and Rebecca, I've really enjoyed that conversation. Thank you so much for sharing with us. There's been some fascinating stuff there. So I just want to say thank you very much. <laughs>